This is Jim Hendershot uh, presenting lecture number 31. It's time to discuss the, uh, the uh, torque versus speed relationship with permanent magnet uh, brushless uh, SPMs, IPMs, and PMSMs uh, with, uh, with uh, emphasis on the case of T versus the case of E. The uh, servo motors were historically powered by batteries or SCR variable voltage drives and controls. The motor engineer characterized each motor using, in those days, years ago, using a what's known as a prony brake, which is invented in Paris by, in, the, in 1821 by Gaspard de Prony. Uh, People sometimes call it a pony brake, but it's a prony brake. And <clears throat> and what this does is it takes a rotating shaft uh, and applies a, a friction load uh, and uh, with a moment arm and a moment arm, as you see here, and a and a, and a and a known mass or weight on the end of that arm. So torque equals the the mass times the moment arm, and that's a, a prony brake. The original ones used uh, uh, wooden brake blocks, and uh, these bolts were tightened so that this tightened to the point where this just barely slipped, and, uh, you, and you'd hang weights on here and, uh, and determine. Later, <clears throat> later versions of this, they used a big pulley on the shaft and wrapped a rope around it and hung a rope on the Hung, hung a weight on the rope and the diameter the pulley might be this big as big as this moment arm and you wrap a rope around it and hang the mass on the rope and so the friction of the rope on the OD of the pulley became the brony brake that's how torque was measured now today we use modern dynamometers like this with a uh, a uh, test motor and a loading motor which can be a brake or a generator with a torque transducer in between. So uh, this is a modern dynamometer that's used. And when you're testing a motor using a dynamometer like that, we talked about this in an earlier uh, tutorial, we have four quadrants of operation. We have clockwise torque and speed, or we have counterclockwise torque and speed in the third quadrant. But in the uh, here we have braking but we're still going the same speed as, as we're still going clockwise we're braking so the torque's negative here we're uh, we're going the opposite direction but the torque is positive so we're braking in this quadrant at all and uh, for 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 the motors that uh, the particular motors that we're talking about all f all three of these motors as a matter of fact we're talking about uh, the operation in in at least two of these quadrants, and uh, the one we'll concentrate on uh, is the positive torque at speed. So, so we have a constant torque region, and then a constant power region. As the speed increases, the torque decreases. That's typical of traction motors, and that's uh, what's required for these motors in question here. And uh, this constant torque region, in the case of a PM machine, is determined by applying a constant current. Uh, the uh, uh, original permanent magnet DC motors like you see here in this cutaway where where you have a wound armature and you have permanent magnets here that supply the field and the uh, there's a single phase winding that's uh, that's uh, consists of a whole bunch of coils wrapped around this armature in these slots and powers DC is applied to to that all those coils in series through these brushes and through this commutator and these bars are connected to each one of the coils so as this rotate it uh, connects the right polarity of current flowing through the coils to link the right flux with the polarity of, of the magnets and and so uh, case of E equals case of T volt seconds per radiant at the same exact uh, numerical value as Newton, Peters, Newton meters per amp so if you uh, at locked rotor, there's no back EMF, so the, the resistance across here divided into the applied DC voltage determines the current, that's its value of current, so that's why the torque's so high. K 
case of T times that value of current gives you this torque. Now at the other end of the scale, you have, uh, you have the voltage constant. So whatever the voltage is, uh, you divide that into the, uh, you divide the case of E into the applied DC voltage and, and multiply that times a thousand and that gives you the speed of the no load speed. So you draw, and, the, and of course the current is almost zero at that point because you're not producing any torque. The only current that's required is the current it, it, that due to the voltage drop in the windings due to the resistance here. So, so the true no load is where this goes to zero. So the true no load is there. This is the apparent no load speed, which there is a little torque there. Uh, and oh, there's also a friction component because these, uh, these brushes act like a little brake on there, like a little drag brake, like the Promy brake. And so, so that would cause a little current. So if you draw a straight line between these two, you have the torque speed curve of a DC permanent magnet DC motor. Now, now the brushless machines are just like this. They're no different than this. The only difference is that uh, uh, the the uh, the brushless machine is commutated with transistors, so they have a current limit. So that means that you couldn't go to this uh, this torque value because the torque trans the torque the transistors are not designed to handle that much torque, so they're going to be limited by something here. And what has happened, the inverter guys that develop brushless motors, they turn this, this speed torque curve around and they plot torque on this axis and speed on that axis, which we'll see in this example here. Here's a case of a brushless version of that. It's not, a, it could be a straight line, but it's not a straight line. Uh, this is called the constant torque region. That is equivalent to some value in, in this axis because it's been reversed. We have torque on vertical and the, and the speed on the horizontal. And the, the reasons why this uh, torque speed was changed from a speed torque is somewhat mystifying. I suppose some inverter guys have some good ideas of why they wanted to do that, but motor guys wanted to keep it the same way we learned it, but the drive guys want to uh, show it this way for application purposes. I don't know what reasons, but that's the way it's published. and tested now. They won the arguments. I worked for Pacific Scientific at the time. We got a big argument with uh, with uh, marketing on that and we lost because the CEO stuck with marketing's view of it. So so what, what we have here, that's this little war story on the side there that doesn't have anything to do with why we're here. But uh, the point is that uh, here, this is your max speed that you want to operate this motor and you have two max torque values. You have a rated torque value which is a thermal issue. And you have a peak torque value, which is also a thermal issue, but it, it doesn't have 100% duty cycle. This is a peak torque, and this is very useful in servo systems for accelerating a load. This can be uh, uh, relevant to a traction drive on a, on a choo-choo train or, or on, a, on a bulldozer or a uh, motorcycle or a car or a bus or a truck or anything when you're accelerating the vehicle for a few seconds or a minute or so, you need the, all the torque you can get. And this would be limited in the machine, this peak torque value will be limited by saturation. And, and, and you want to marry an inverter with that such that the, the current capability of the inverter can produce that much torque. So you could say that this, uh, this peak torque is limited by the saturation of the rotor or of the of the motor as well as being limited by the current capacity of the inverter driving it and the rated value is somewhere below that now now this motor will produce power anywhere inside this envelope but with that inverter driving it will not produce power outside this envelope that's what's important here this is a constant torque range and this is the constant power range um, Here's a case where we've uh, taken the, the, uh, the, a, a, our brushless motor and we've, uh, just for our conceptual purposes, what we've done is we've, uh, we've uh, theoretically plotted a, a, a torque speed curve all the way to stall, assuming we don't have any saturation or we don't have 
any current limits by the inverter so we plot that curve on there so that you could clearly see how the the real curve and the desired curve fit inside of that if you reduce the voltage by the way the voltage is too low and we can't fit our 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 actual desired curve inside of this envelope with if so if the voltage is too low you can't you can't achieve the torques you want at higher speeds there's not enough voltage the back emf this says that uh, with with this voltage the back emf of the machine is higher than this voltage so you can never operate up there that's here's a, an actual calculation using some simulation finite element simulation software of of uh, the, the torque speed curve uh, driven by a six-step drive even and as you and then that's been projected onto the same scale and that's where you see that uh, if the voltage drops below it below a certain amount it won't that inverter will not produce have the motor produce power at those speeds so uh, uh, brushless DC machines versus uh, permanent magnet synchronous machines and what are the difference in, in commutation the uh, brushless machine, independent of the vacuum wave shape, uh, you know and what that means is it doesn't matter whether it's a sinusoidal or trapezoidal or anywhere between. That's what that means. It's the it's uh, a commutation is related only to the control system or the inverter type used. Six step DC switch commutation. At uh, uh, the, by the way, this is a uh, typo. This is 60 degrees electrical per step or per commutation switch that mentally change that to a 60 degree two phases are power at a time producing torque the current in the two phases for plus or minus 120 degree electrical commutation out of 180 so uh, we're going to look at that graphically see what that means but we don't commutate we don't have the phases on all the time we wait uh, 120 from 180 is 60 there's 30 degrees on the on the turn on end and 30 degrees on the turn off end giving you the 60 degree difference between 180 possible commutation angle and 120 so we're only using two phases on for two-thirds of the possible time during rotation electrically that you could produce torque so you're getting 67 percent copper utilization for only two-thirds of the time the average current to the phase affected the average current per phase is affected by the inductance and the RPM because the R, it's affected by the RPM because because of the back EMF uh, the faster you go the less voltage you have because of the back EMF is higher and you have a fixed DC rail voltage so the max speed with if you want to increase the speed beyond the the place where uh, you don't have enough voltage headroom to force the current in you have to do what's known as they call it phase advancing uh, the drive guys will call it field weakening but the motor guy calls it phase advancing the motor designer doesn't think of weakening the field because he really didn't weaken the field the fields the same the magnets are there the field is there all you do is change where the flux link you've changed the flux linkage that's what field weakening does it changes the flux weakening by ad, the flux linkage by advancing the the turn on angle with respect to the magnet poles so that's really phase advancing advancing now for sinusoidal machines which are called permanent magnet synchronous machines and there again it doesn't matter whether the back EMF is sinusoidal or not. It's immaterial. It can be square wave, or sine wave, or anything in between. The, the uh, consequences of driving a square wave machine at, 300, at 180 degree commutation with all three phases all the time, like a sine uh, with sinusoidal currents, the consequences of using a, a trapezoid back EMF with that is, is, is harmonics, some heating, some harmonics has nothing to do with whether the motor will run or not or how it runs or anything like that it only relates to heat so so a, a, a PMSM is not necessarily a sign back EMF machine even though it's assumed to now there's two ways of controlling the current with sinusoidal drives let's call it sinusoidal drives 180 degree electrical commutation 
you can use, as we've said before, hysteresis control of the current, which is a, 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 a reference. There, in the control system, there's a sine wave reference signal that you could generate in software. You can get it on a chip, in firmware on a chip, the control chip that you buy. And then there's a, a high-low hysteresis bandwidth around that reference sinusoidal single, signal. And you PWM the voltage to turn the voltage on and off to keep the current inside that hysteresis bandwidth. And you typically need about 20 PWM chops minimum per uh, cycle, per 360 degree cycle to have a decent sinusoidal wave shape within that hysteresis band. Now, space vector control is different. It, it generates sinusoidal currents and ejects them down each leg of the wire delta. And it does that by, by controlling uh, two current vectors and, and the transformation of the, the two current vectors into three sinusoidal currents is done by transformation using Parks uh, uh, transformations. And uh, that, that's control theory. That's not my specialty. That's not what we're here for. But that's how it's done. But basically, you're still generating sinusoidal currents. And there's a hysteresis band based on the PWM frequency just because of that. And so you're putting current in all three phases all the time, 100% copper utilization. And the torque ripple, if you have sinusoidal currents, sinusoidal back EMF, the torque ripple is near zero. This gives you the lowest torque ripple, not counting cogging. We're not talking about cogging. Cogging is an open circuit uh, torque phenomenon, where a, a ripple torque is the, uh, is the energized or the driven or the commutated torque output. And it also exhibits lower audible noise and vibration. The other thing we're going to see is that you can achieve power or torque at higher speeds. You take a given motor. I don't care how the back EMF wave shape looks like. You drive it with six steps drive, and you're going to have to start phase advancing much sooner than you will if you drive the same motor with a sinusoidal drive. And I'll show you later why that's true. So you could produce torque at much higher speeds with a sine drive with the same motor you can with a six-step drive. And uh, and if if you're driving a sine uh, a D and Q axis current control with an IPM, you can achieve a very high constant power range. So here's a block diagram of the drive. Everybody's seen this. Uh, you know what this is about. Uh, Here's a typical uh, power and torque curve of a uh, of a PM AC synchronous uh, assigned driven motor. This is a brushless motor, and here we have our our constant uh, uh, torque range, and then our constant power range. And this is actually representative of the Ramey IPM, the Permanent Magnet Synchronous Reluctance IPM Ramey motor, and this is published right in their literature. Uh, as you can see, this motor puts out peak torques, very high, 325 newton meters, uh, up to uh, oh, almost 3,000 RPM, and then it drops down and it goes all the way up to 10,000 RPM. That's a heck of a constant power range. All right, and here's the, uh, the power output of this thing on the same units. It's almost a hundred kilowatt peak, but the, the power peaks out at right at uh, turn down speed, which is where you'd expect. This happens to be a ten pole motor. You know, there's no frequency involved in this at all. Now uh, we we've talked about these two case of D and these two motor constants, case of D and case of E, several times. We know what that is, but uh, what's uh, what's important here? Is uh, uh, is how this varies with temperature. That's the purpose of this. Uh, the uh, they're going to vary because the flux varies, 
And remember, the, these equal flux in the machine times the number of conductors in the machine. That's that linkage of that product is what determines what these values are. And the turns certainly aren't going to change. So that means that the torque per amp is going to vary as the temperature coefficient of the magnet grade used. And you can see ferrites are worst. Uh, neodymium is pretty poor. Sumerian cobalt has the best. These And the demagnetization uh, uh, temperature coefficients are even worse and more serious for demagnetization. Uh, the, the case of T, case of E versus flux linkage, as you could see here, uh, this is all based on Faraday's law. And uh, you've, you've got a full pitch coil with, with N number of turns, and that, that, uh, that coil links the flux of the rotor. Uh, different types of PM motors. Uh, with historical P, uh, PM DC machines, they're equal. The motor constants are equal. With uh, with uh, PM DC brushless, uh, they're only equal if the back EMF is trapezoidal and there's no ripple in the back EMF. AC motor it depends on the shape of the back EMF and the definition. And if you if you read chapter eight in this book. There's a very detailed explanation of this and how to calculate the the uh, the case of T after you've measured the case of E. The case of E is very easy to measure. You just spin the motor in a drill press or with a hand drill and take a scope and look across the, the leads and, and you uh, capture the magnitude of the back EMF and the shape of the back EMF. And so the shape of that is what determines the case of T if you if you're going to drive this as a sinusoidal, if you're going to if, if the case of T is pertinent to a, a sinusoidal excitation, uh, and it, it it requires a, a detailed analysis of what the wave shape looks like, uh, you come to a pretty good approximation if you if you define the case of B and the case of T of the the PMAC machine. If it's going to be driven as a PMAC machine, if you if you read off the scope the peak case of B, and convert that to the peak case of T, then you have a pretty good uh, relationship that you could use for calculating torque and speed. But the the actual uh, detailed ratio uh, depends on the uh, of the of the torque versus the voltage constant depends on the REMS line current to the motor. So uh, uh, you, I guess you would have to, you can't multiply the RMS line current to the motor to the peak using the peak torque constant. That's what I'm trying to say. The peak flux linkage per phase, motor constant calculation for trapezoid full wave 100 grain degree commutation, this becomes, uh, so what this boils down to, we get down to the case of E equation that we're going to design our motor to for a, uh, a three-phase, six-step, 120-degree commutative motor. You use this formula here. This is the key formula that we need to, to uh, decide how many turns per coil because we know all these other things. We know how many poles there are. We know what the winding factor is. We know that there's two-thirds of the of the the conductors are producing torque at a time and uh, these these are uh, winding distribution factors skew factors things like that if there's any parallel paths you got to insert the number of those in here since it's one night and put it in there and this is the flux the magnet flux per pole and uh, uh, this is pole pairs so two pole pairs is the number of poles and this equation is for Y connected machines. If the phase winds are connected in delta, this two thirds factor is replaced by one third. Now, if we have a sine machine, we go through all the same stuff. We wind up with a, uh, a formula for the case of, the case of E, which looks like this. If it's a delta connection, the, the root three is eliminated, and Z is still the total number of conductors in the machine, which is two turn two times two divided by. Uh, 
No. Uh, total numbers uh, conductors in the machine is the turns per coil times two times the number of coils per phase. And of course, this is a flux, uh, air gap flux density per pole that we determined previously. So uh, there's one more motor constant here that's very useful for comparing one machine to another. And uh, this has been used, and it's 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 a it's a motor constant that you'll find in many motor catalogs. And what this is is a uh, a constant, a figure of merit that's related to the losses in the machine. See, so uh, uh, it's a value without units, and it's listed in most motor vendor catalogs. Certainly, PMDC, all their catalogs, and many uh, brushless motor catalogs that are used as servo motors or torque motors will will record this value. You won't find traction motors for vehicles use this very much. There's a couple ways you could present this. The uh, the torque constant is uh, is measure, measured or calculated and the line to line uh, resistance can be Measured so the this uh, this case of M or this motor uh, torque uh, motor constant is is given as a case of T divided by the root uh, the square root of the terminal resistance or or the uh, rated torque of the machine divided by the square root of the of the uh, of the power it takes to uh, or, or the losses it takes to uh, produce the I squared R loss, the root of the I squared R losses to uh, produce that torque. So this is how you compare one motor to the other. It's a very important parameter that a lot of people just swear by. So that's how you calculate. So that ends this lecture series, and and that uh, what that did was showed you how to calculate the torque as well as the number of turns. If you know the torque desired, you solve for the number of turns. Thank you very much.